From war across the globe, to regulating speech, to printing trillions of dollars, the American regime accepts no limits on its power. As Ludwig von Mises understood, the state will take as much power as the people will let it. And in recent years, the American regime has clearly concluded it can get away with unilaterally adopting vast new powers. Join Michael Rechtenwald, Ted Galen Carpenter, Jonathan Newman, and more for a Mises Institute event in Nashville, Tennessee on September 23rd, dedicated to this siege of power and one of Ron Paul's favorite lines, truth is treason in the empire of lies. Tickets begin at $95. Get yours at Mises.org slash Nashville 23. That's M-I-S-E-S dot -E org slash Nashville 23. This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Ryan, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. It's great to be with you, Bob. So the, the news hook, folks, for what we're going to be talking about is the we recent uh, loss for the women's team in the World Cup uh, and the infamous uh, Megan Rapinoe missed uh, penalty kick. But then we're going to just, you know, broaden the discussion talking about, you know, because she's obviously uh, has earned the ire of many people on the right for her comments about equal pay for women in sports and, you know, more generally. So that's going to be more of the economic discussion, but I did want to start, uh, <laughs> I guess you didn't see it, uh, Ryan, but on Twitter, Matt Walsh, your, your good buddy, you know, who you, uh, have had a, uh, exchange with before. Um, he, he tweeted, you know, the video of Rapinoe's, you know, she kicks it over the, over the crossbar to the right and said something like, you know, I have kicked a soccer ball zero times in my life, but I could have had a better shot than that. Okay. And I saw a lot of commentary and people, you know, guffawing because they hate her guts anyway. And, oh, America hating, you know, blah, 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 whiny brat with her funny colored hair. Good serves her right. She's terrible. My grandma could make that shot. So let me just explain for people. There's a little bit of game theory involved <laughs> at this level that, y yes, obviously, if you... If you d don't kick it on net, you miss all the, you know, that you, you get like a Wayne Gretzky adaptation that you make 0% of the shots that aren't on net, obviously. But what she was trying to do was hit it in the top right corner because if you get it on net there, that's unstoppable. Whereas, you know, goalies more so with the men, but with the women too. Like if you guys, we'll put a, we'll put a link folks. It's, it's not a long, it's like seven minutes or something, but it's very rapid fire to just see the penalty shootout. It's, it's you know, relatively interesting, even if you think soccer is boring in general, where the, you know, the women keep lining up and they, you know, they alternate teams and take penalty shots, but the goalies did, I think, save two of the sh shots. And also Rapinoe was not the only one. There were two others. I think one from the U S and then one from Sweden that sailed it right over. And one of them was even, you know, more off target than hers was. So it's not like this is unheard of for a pro to have a shot like that. But anyway, my point being it's you, 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 how it works is you can pick a slot and like, if you say, oh, if you go left and maybe you try to like make it look like you're going to kick right and go left. But if the goalie guesses correctly and you're, and you don't have it up in a corner, like the, the goalie can block it. And so that's the, you know, the rationale for what she was trying to do there. So again, it's the trade-offs involved and okay. But if you try to do that sweet spot and if you're off, then, you know, it sails over like it did in this case. We'll also link to, there was a, uh, a, a Levet, the, you know, the, um, Freakonomics guy, he had Ryan, a, a, a co-authored journal article on mixed mixed strategy equilibria and, and penalty kicks. And so of course, you know, as they do, they roll up their sleeves and get into looking at the history. I think it was men's teams there, but just again, showing that it, it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors. If, if, if it became known that everybody always just shot at you know, the high pro probability area, then the goalie would know that and they would move there and always block it. So then you couldn't do that. And so anyway, I don't know if you have any comments on the, the purely soccer element of this before we dive into the, the gender well, equity stuff. Well, I, I mean, the, the point is, is that Megan Rapinoe isn't necessarily a complete moron that there is actual strategy. And <laughs> sometimes, yeah, you take a risk and it doesn't end well. So I, yeah, there isn't, this doesn't prove anything, right? The fact that this person missed a shot 
doesn't really prove anything about the lower quality of women's soccer or anything like that. And uh, yeah, I think we'll just get into. Yeah, there's, yeah, what there's the also real issue an example. I forget the guy's name. I, I don't watch professionals. I played when I was much younger, but I don't watch professionals. But yeah, people were defenders of rap and all were. There's clips of like famous male soccer players too, you know, like superstars who even in a clutch game, a clutch shot, you know, they sail it over too. So like it does happen. It's it's like missing a free throw that the best NBA players don't make 100% of their free throws. Like, yeah, the really good ones in clutch, you expect them to. And if they miss, people can say, oh, yeah, you lost us the championship. But you wouldn't say, oh, I can make a free throw, even though, mo- you know, you might be able to. <laughs> but it doesn't mean, so therefore you belong in the NBA, and that guy's a schlub. So, okay, so having now that we've given the modest defense, the qualified defense of Rapinoe and her shot selection and soccer prowess, Let's move on to, she was interviewed after, and, and they said, you know, what's your, because I think this was like her career ending thing. That's what made it all the more, you know, heartbreaking on her part. And, and I think she said something like, well, the, my best memory is, is getting equal pay, right? So that's what she's going to go down in history for is, you know, her championing that. And I know you've written on this, Ryan, for Mises.org. So what, what are your thoughts just to get the ball rolling here in our economics discussion? Well, there's just this whole idea that uh, soccer players, uh, whether male or female, uh, deserve the same pay because they're playing the same sport uh, just betrays a complete misunderstanding of how pay works and how worker productivity works. And I think maybe at the core of this was uh, the best example was given by some guys years, several years ago, it was about 2018 or so, at Comedy Central where they provided a chart showing that, oh, well, the women's team has won all of these games and they, they, uh, they've won various championships and they're clearly very good soccer players and, and look, they're, uh, they're just they're elite players. So they're, they're doing better than the men's team, which wasn't able to progress as far in the World Cup championship and they don't have as good of a win-loss record and all of this stuff. And they said, well, so this proves that the women are better than the men's team. Well, uh, that's completely irrelevant, really, when it comes to paying people things. How many games you win in some league, it just has nothing to do with it, because the amount of pay you get has always been dependent on how much productivity as a worker you can provide your employer. So the more productive pro athletes are the people who bring in larger audiences, who earn more money. Uh, for the league and people who can provide less value to the league in that way get paid less. That's all there is to it. It has nothing to do with how many games you won. I mean, there is some connection between, yeah, your baseball team is really terrible and your baseball team is really great and the better baseball team generally earns more money. Um, But even that's not always true. I mean, you can still make a profit on a lousy baseball team in many cases. Uh, But really just what matters to the player specifically is how much merchandise are you selling based on their popularity? How many viewers are being brought in uh, based on the popularity of this player? And so that's what matters, not how many games you win. And so it's just, they're completely missing the point by thinking there's some objective standard in sports that determines how good you are as an athlete. And then that therefore should determine your pay. Yeah. So if I don't mention this, I know we're going to get complaints. So let me make sure we don't forget to say it. What's also ironic too. So, so your, your point is the more essential, more fundamental one, Ryan, that it, you know, they're, that's not how pay works period. You know, if we're talking about compensation in sports, it really isn't directly, you know, about how good you are. And we, and we'll, you know, I want to come back to that and, and unpack that a bit, but even on its own terms, it's a little bit weird when people would say loosely, Oh yeah, the women's team is so much better than the men's team. When you know pro women lose to like fifteen year old boys teams, you know, or or they hold their own or something, you know what I mean? So it's it's not literally the case that if you took the women's team and put them head to head against the male pro team, they, they would just be a you know they would probably get hurt. It would be a bloodbath, and, and certainly the scoreboard would would reflect that. Um, and so the, the, there's that element that what we mean is relative to their peers. Now, having said that. That's not an unfair comparison. Like when we say things like, you know, who is the greatest baseball player of all time? And so, oh, you know, Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle, whatever people, Ty Cobb. If you took them from their era and took them on to t- against today's pitchers, they wouldn't be as good. 
right? Or, you know, or, you know, Bobby Fischer, he's blowing people out of the water. And so he's, you know, considered, you know, one of the greatest, even though he would lose to Magnus today. So I think it's in general, it's fair. Or another example, not having to do with competitions, like Isaac Newton was clearly a better physicist than me, even though I actually know a lot more physics than he did. Right. But it would be dumb for me to say I'm a better. Okay. So you get that. So you're always doing it in terms of relative to the field, your con your relevant peer group, your competition at the time. So I'm okay with the understanding of saying, no, the women's team was better in a sense. And I think that probably has to do with, you know, that women's soccer got booted up in, in the United States, you know, relative to other countries, you know, we kind of had a head start, whereas, you know, men had been playing soccer in Europe for a lot longer. You know, they, I think they even call it football over there. Those, those weirdos. Um, so, you know, there's, there's all that involved, but, but yeah, coming back to what you're saying, I mean, I guess I, I, I should have done the research ahead of time, Ryan, but it wouldn't surprise me. Like when Michael Jordan decided to go play baseball, I don't know, you know, how they worked that out, but it wouldn't surprise me if he got paid more than some other guy on the same team who had a better, you know, batting average and, you know, had fewer errors out in the field. And, and that wouldn't, it would just be no because if Michael Jordan's playing your team, you're going to sell more tickets. Period, and that's what the owners. It, it would make business sense for them to have him, and maybe not play him as much. Maybe if it's a close game, <laughs> not not put him in, uh, but only put him in. You know when the winners because he you know wasn't as good as some of his uh, peers. Um, so and, yeah, yeah any your, any reaction? Uh, to, ten runs to ahead. Those thoughts, you, right? Yeah, <laughs> you you can put Michael in. I think a lot of the misunderstanding comes from the fact that. Uh, pro spectator sports, which is what we're talking about here is it's, it's a performance. It's, it's an entertainment venue. Mm -hmm. And so I know the, the country is full. And of course, this isn't like unique to Americans, right? This, this need to imbue sports competitions with, with like deeper meaning and with something that is, is strikes at your the heart of you as an individual and and the team with which you identify and all this stuff and it's not modern either i i was just reminded the other day that one of the worst riots in uh roman history was in uh uh constantinople in the time of justinian where thirty thousand people died in a series of riots that were brought on by essentially chariot sports competitions uh because people identified so deeply uh, with their sports team and and that extended out even into politics and which uh, aspirant to the throne you would support and all of this stuff. So sports identification is at the center of the human experience, apparently. Um, but when we're talking about sports that we go watch, it's it's just watching performers and it's about making money based on certain people out there running around being popular with the masses and uh, bringing in dollars spent by people who pay to be entertained and that's what it's about so the, the the amount you win is all really beside the point this is just as much a performance as going to a movie or a play mm -hmm. or anything like that that's the proper way of uh of really looking at it, just like an actor's income is not dependent on how many awards they've won, but on how large their audience is. And that's, you just need to remember that that's what pro sports is. These people are performers. There's not some deeper value there. Yeah. I'm glad you went in the analogy with, uh, you know, acting and same thing with, you know, the music industry. It's, it's not, you know, there, there can be plenty of musical artists that a lot of people would say, oh, they're terrible. They're, you know, that person's a hack or, you know, it's just, yeah, they, or there's, you know, it's a boy band and the, you know, executives just pick them together and whatever, and they have a formula. And there's certainly, there could be other people in show business that have a much wider range that they don't, you know, they hit the notes better. You know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of, so they're more musically talented and yet they're not as famous. They certainly don't make as much money. And so, yeah, the, the connection and, I guess, you know, if people want to say, oh, right, there's unfairness all over the place, uh, you know, I, I guess I can't prove you wrong, but really what it, it's not the fault of capitalism or, or the market economy. It just comes down to that's what people want to pay for. So if you want to push back the analysis to the tastes of the public are fickle and irrational and what, okay, but let's just be clear on, you know, what's, what's being blamed or what the source of it is. So certainly if more people wanted to watch if more Americans wanted to watch the women's club and that meant 
that there was a bigger viewership and so then that the TV stations could charge more for advertisers to come and watch then they would get paid more than the men but that well, you know that wasn't the case historically and that's why the numbers played out the way they did just like you were saying Ryan that somebody who everyone agrees is a much better act I mean Marlon Brando famously didn't memorize his lines for a lot of his roles. He would just be winging it and they would have to write it. Like when he was in Superman, apparently he would just learn the first line, walk onto the scene and then be kind of doing that and then look up and they would have it written up there for him to say, but it was, Hey, it was Marlon Brando. You know, what are you going to do? Even though other people on the set could be complaining, like I at least memorized my lines. How come he doesn't have to, you know, how come they're paying him so much? Well, cause you put him in the movie it's going to make it, you know, give it gravitas. People say, oh, this isn't just a comic book thing. There's Marlon Brando's in this movie. This is amazing. So there you go. Yeah. Could we really say that the high, most highly paid actors are the best actors, right? I just, <laughs> that, that just doesn't make any sense. So uh, yeah, the same thing applies to sports. Right. And, and certainly we agree with that in, in economics too, right? That we would not agree that, oh yeah, if you want to go find the best economists, Go see who's won the most awards. Go see who's teaching at the Ivy League schools. And those are hands down the best economists out there. Obviously, you know, you and I wouldn't endorse that. So uh, now I guess this leads into then the question, like if we do push it back a step though and say, okay, so if, the, if there are these disparities, you know, what's the, what's the source of it? And I think... You know, it's worth distinguishing at least again, just to understand what's causing these things. So that if you, for example, there was this woman Nina Turner. Um, she she was a politician. I don't know if she still is. Do you know who she is, Ryan? No, no. She's big on Twitter. Um, it, it's just maybe because I started following her tweets or whatever, and then you know, it just was she's a sort because she she has a very she'll just do things like you know people need to earn a living wage and you know insulin should be free. You know, real like just statements, imperative declarations. And if you disagree with me, it's, it's because you're a bad person kind of, kind of stands. Uh, and she was, I think she was a state Senator somewhere in the Midwest or something like that. I might be getting mixed up where she, but anyway, that's who she is. And, and she recently had a thing where she had a, and she's a black woman and she had a statistic about, you know, black women get paid. I'm making the numbers 70 cents to the, to the average dollar or the, or the male white's dollar, something like that. And so then I followed up and asked her, well, then how come m most employers don't try to exclusively hire black women? You know, and of course I got a bunch of hearts from my fans and a few of her fans, you know, tepidly tried to argue with me as to why that would be the case. But it, it is weird that critics of capitalism, they have no problems like, oh yeah, the greedy capitalist will shut down the factory, lay off all the U.S. workers and relocate the factory to Indonesia to take advantage of the cheap labor. And then at the same time, they think within the U.S., you know, women and, and, you know, especially minority women get paid a fraction of their counterparts uh, and, and for, for doing the same work. And it's like, well, if the greedy capitalists are willing to move a factory across the ocean to take advantage of cheap, you know, why don't they just, you know, <laughs> hire? Right. Just There's a huge hiring. supply of black women right here. Right. You could just hire just them. Change, yeah. Change your hiring practice. And if you do want to, you know, make it, well, because there's the. Still, shouldn't there be an overwhelming preference that for any job opening, you know, they're the clamoring for the, again, not because they're tenderhearted, but because, you know, well, according to your own statistics and argument, you're saying they do this. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Have you, I've never heard a good response to, to that. No, because you can't have it both ways. It can't be both uh, your, the reason that uh, they're getting paid less is uh, just because f for some unknowable reason. Uh, it's just greed. They just don't want to pay people as much. Um, and that's the motivation. And then at the same time, when they have the opportunity to just pay people less, they don't take it. And, so, and also, if it's just because they're racist, why do they insist on giving jobs to non-white people in foreign countries? Uh, it's, it's just sort of a muddled thinking where we just come up with whatever reason sounds good at any given time. And uh, no, I don't think there's an attempt to really answer it in any systematic way because it you don't have to. I mean, you just, here here's a, it's a performance. You just have to please your audience at any given time and tell them what they think is is convincing just in that moment. Well, yeah. So it's illustrating the point that it's not the people with the best arguments get the most Twitter <laughs> followers. So yeah, so we, I shouldn't be complaining. Um, 
Now, I should I want to mention too. I don't want to just leave it at that because then some people conclude like, oh, either like with with reassurance or with anger, and they say, oh, so you're saying there's no real problem here, and everyone just gets paid their marginal product in a store. No, I mean, you would want to investigate why do those disparities exist? And I would say, for example, you know, so-called public schools are terrible, especially in inner cities, and they disproportionately affect black children and things like that. And there's other, the drug war disproportionately affects black families. And so there's all sorts of reasons that I could point to things that I think are unjust policies that might contribute to this outcome. But again, my, my more modest point is it it just cannot be that systematically there's this huge supply of workers who do the same work and only charge 70 cents or, you know, then you could hire them for 70 cents on the dollar. And yet all the employer, cause it's not even that you need all the employers to see the light. It's just, you would need a handful of them. And then they would just have, you know, predominantly black workforces or women and, you know, to take advantage of it. And yet we don't, we don't see that. Okay. So it, that's, you know, why isn't Oprah just hiring, you know, I, I don't, I may, you know, maybe people will come back and say, oh, she does. I don't, I don't know the specifics of Oprah's workforce, but clearly there's plenty of employers that it cannot be that, oh yeah, they just really hate women and they hate, you know, people with brown or black skin. And that's, that's the explanation, you know, that has to be, again, it doesn't mean, if you want to say the U S is systemically racist, you can still say that, but it can't be because of the nature of the hiring and, and compensation process. You'd have to push it back a step to talk about the police and the public school systems and things like that, I would think. Right. Because if, at the employer's end, they're just looking at what is the available labor and they want the most product, uh, productive people, generally speaking, especially at the larger firms where you're hiring more just based on numbers and what you hope you can get out of the employee. And there's, there's not much of a personal relationship there. And yeah, if you're going to have certain groups that seem that, oh, they're, they're not as well educated, they're not coming with as much to the table, that's not the employer's issue. Is that something that has to do with the, where the person is coming from, the, the education they had available to them? And uh, it's, it's, it, it's much too late for the employer to do anything about that by the time that they just have employees coming to them and they're applying for jobs and the employer looks out there and they're saying, well, I can hire these people who already have the desirable job skills, or I can expend a bunch of money training these other people to bring them uh, up to snuff. And so there, <laughs> there are arguably, yeah, issues here far beyond just simply, um, oh, hey, I'd, I'm just going to hire, or workers are more or less a uniform group, and I just don't hire that group because I just don't like them. There are maybe in the aggregate some differences among different groups that affects the employer's decision, but the employer isn't why there are these differences among these different groups. And uh, to act like the employer is therefore somehow responsible for this reality um, is, is a little bizarre, really, considering everything that goes on to create a person's productivity well before they apply for a job at Corporation X. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, since we were talking about sports, I remember I can't remember. Do you remember the who Marge Shot was? Mm -hmm. Does that mean? The, and, and what, what do you remember? What team she owned? I think it was the Reds. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. I didn't want to say that, but but I will agree with you. So anyway, <laughs> folks, if you're not familiar with her, there was this thing. So she was a ball club owner, and and by the way, see, woman owned business. There you go. And um, and she, it was like they caught hers. I don't know if it was a a hot mic or something, or it was a phone call that somebody leaked. Do you remember the details uh, of how we got this? I mean, my memory is pretty much yours that she had said something like in a board meeting or semi public, you know, it wasn't like prepared yeah. remarks or anything. Right. So she, yeah, it was a kind of thing where she obviously wouldn't have intended it for, to be broadcast to the public. And somehow it didn't, I don't remember the details, but yeah, saying very disparaging things about black athletes, maybe the ones on her own payroll, but still, she was hiring them and they were earning millions of dollars because obviously right. you would be crazy to try to have a, a, a modern, you know, baseball team and, you know, just hire white guys like that just wouldn't work. So it just, I got illustrating our point here that it's, it's not merely that you have to not be raised, you know, that, oh, there's going to be a few people who aren't racist in order to, it's like, you know, even out and out racist in terms of their personal views, if they're driven by the profit motive, you know, the market economy says, no, you go and hire people. And so, yeah, if there's, qualified shortstops out there and you don't like the kind of person they are, the color of their skin. But if you're a business person, 
you can't ignore, you know, the, the realities of, of the situation if you want your business to succeed. So it's it's not saying, oh, racism doesn't exist, but it's saying it's it's like the, it's almost the opposite of what the conventional leftist critics believe that if anything, raw capitalism punishes employers for harboring arbitrarily racist views. Or really, I should say, if you discriminate, that that's the issue. So yeah, if there's, you know, just think of it this way. There's a qualified candidate, you know, there's there's two candidates who are equally qualified and one is some group you don't like personally. And the the one person from the group you do like, you know, you have to pay them 100,000 and the other person would do the same job for 80,000. If your prejudice leads you to discriminate and hire the $100,000 person because you personally think like, oh yeah, they're not going to steal from me or something. If your view is baseless, in a sense, you just lost twenty thousand dollars, right? So you know you can you can in a sense loosely say that the market you know fined you twenty thousand dollars for your incorrect view, and and in terms of opportunity cost at the very least. And so it's you know and, and I, I like that approach too because then the worse you, the discrimination is, the bigger the quote implicit fine is. And so you know that's a very elegant way of harnessing it. Um, and also, too, maybe I don't know if it's worth transitioning into now, uh, Ryan. But people, you know, would bring up stuff like, "Oh, what about you know the Jim Crow laws and things like?" Well, they were Jim Crow laws, okay. So that's that's kind of a thing that people a lot of times forget is, yes, if you have some community that has you know views that, from our vantage point, we would say, yeah, those people were backward, had bigoted views and whatever. But a lot of times, the way the community enforced its views was through the government because they knew. If we don't just have a blanket rule that, you know, black people can't eat at the lunch counter, well, then some business is going to open up, you know, some crazy guy who's going to let them do that. And, and then, but that, so that <laughs> kind of got underscoring that your issue is not with capitalism and, you know, free market entry per se. Yeah, Jim Crow laws are a way for a small elite to uh, protect uh, certain interests from competition, really, because all that means is that, oh, these are certain values that we demand that everybody share. And so if you attempt to engage in business practices that depart from what we, the elites, think is important, we are able to punish you for that, for precisely the same reason that they may identify a part of the market that is underserved and could make easy money then by serving that part of the market. And I actually addressed that in an article I wrote called The, the, the Trouble with Public Accommodation. And public accommodation as envisioned by the Supreme Court in certain cases, right, is this idea that if you have a hotel, you have to serve anybody, uh, regardless of what member of a, a particular group uh, that they're in. Uh, but I note as part of that discussion that there have been, over history, many groups that, that attempt to do exactly what Jim Crow laws did not allow, which was to address these underserved groups and to say, hey, you don't have anyone who's providing you with the products and services you want, so I'm going to do that. And now, uh, feel free then to give me all your money. <laughs> and, and this has been highly successful in many cases, and there's actually a lot of research on this. Generally, if you want to look it up, it's the research under ethnic enclaves, as discussed by economists and sociologists for the most part. So what it means is that you could take someone like... Um, Say the person who, interestingly, he was uh, he was recently criticized, I think, for saying something about LGBT or whatever. He had founded a Hispanic foods corporation um, where he said, "Okay, there, I'm a Puerto Rican," is what he was saying, and that there's not there's not enough uh, really private sector stuff that's providing food and uh, helping Puerto Rican restaurants and other Hispanics. Uh, with these sorts of food services, uh, deliveries, and all sorts of stuff that they need inputs for their restaurants and so on. So he founded a firm uh, specifically devoted to helping these people get the products that they needed. And it took off because in the post-war period, there was a lot of, there was a growing market in Mexican restaurants and other uh, Hispanic type restaurants. And he was able to get a big market. And a lot of other firms either had refused to do business with these people or showed no particular interest in advertising to them or catering to them. And those sorts of enterprises can be extremely successful. And so as long as you allow people to do that sort of thing, you can create whole new parts of the economy that are very productive and also help lots of entrepreneurs by catering to them. 
And that's why you need laws in some cases to prevent that sort of thing from happening. Uh, but we could note <clears throat> many other cases as well. And what researchers have noted is, is that it's not just, of course, foods or things like that. They note cases where Japanese and Korean people came together to uh, start up banks on their own. We're talking like in the early 20th century up until the mid 20th century that there were Korean community banks and Japanese community banks. And they tended to favor, of course, other Koreans and Japanese and would make loans to those people. And it really helped build up a foundation uh, for these groups that had been ignored by the larger, quote unquote, white groups or non-Hispanic Anglo groups. And they then moved outward from there, because then once you had established a nice financial and business foundation within these particular enclaves, they were then better able to compete in the larger marketplace. And so they serve actually a very important economic role in identifying particular groups that you're going to serve to. And they were this very entrepreneurial because they're identifying these groups that the larger population wasn't interested in selling to or in serving. And then it just took off from there and was able to make then larger inroads. And a lot of that's often ignored. Um, but that's that's just a case of people really they, there wasn't this objective measure of like, I only want to serve the people who I just imagine to be in most productive or whatever. They were actually targeting people within a certain subgroup and saying, let's just, let's target them. It's not like they, they refused to lend uh, to mm -hmm. whites or outsiders, but it was just that, hey, part of our mission here is, is I know all of these people personally in this particular right. community and I'm going to loan to them because this is a very face-to-face -face type of business. This is a small business mm -hmm. type of situation. Mm -hmm. And they, it was relying on these ethnic networks, and they that's how they made their decisions, was these are people I know, these are people I know I can trust, I know where they live, I know I can get my money if they don't pay me back, and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And that's just been very important uh, to, the, uh, to the larger economy for these groups and for the larger economies. And so you, can't, you need to take into account that there's just many different reasons for people to make loans, to sell goods, to purchase goods. And it just brings us back to this subjective idea, right? That, well, the most the, the amount of payment that I give to somebody is just really on how productive they are and how much people like their services. And there you you, you need to see the wide range of different ways that people value things um, before you can really start to figure out. Uh, why do people hire people? Why do people pay people? And why do people buy certain things? And this is where the Austrians, of course, are very strong in understanding the subjective value behind all of this. Yeah, yeah, great points. Um, yeah, and certainly in my life, I've lived in different areas and, you know, so especially like when I was a student or just out of school and it was not of, you know, high standard of living and I had to live in a, you know, certain neighborhoods that were not the safest places. And yeah, I'll, the demographics and a lot of the local stores, the groceries, the signs are all in Spanish or whatever. And then you're right. Even the product mix, it's not, you know, just a bunch of fruit loops and, and things like that. It's like certain things that I wouldn't have seen at, at, at Walmart or whatever, just different brands that they were carrying, or whatever that were catering to you know, the, you know, the people in that area. You walk around at dinner time. The, the the foods they were cooking did not smell like you know the neighborhood I grew up in. Where they so they have different tastes, and that's the market caters to that. It's funny too because a lot of people they they seem to be generally okay with that kind of stuff. It's it's more you know well it's when the dominant group you know has a preference that's that's what we you know view as un un uh, unabashedly evil. Um, and also too yeah I, I know I do a lot of consulting and in life insurance. In some of the agents there, if they happen to be from a you know a certain ethnic group or a religious persuasion, they tend to specialize in yeah selling life insurance policies to people in their community. And like you say, it's not because the, you know they would sell it to anybody. It's just there's a click there. Like the people in that community, you know, for financial matters, some outsider coming in that doesn't look like them, they might you know be hesitant to tell that person about their finances or whatever. Whereas oh, this person goes to my church. Yeah, I'll sit down and show them this is our credit card debt and whatever, and you know this is how much we make, and yeah, should we get life insurance? Okay, and it's just you know it's it's not a, a thing about bigotry. It's just more you know certain people, especially if they speak a different language from what the you know majority do in the country, they just feel more comfortable in those settings. And you know how could you be against allowing people to to do that and specialize in that way? There's another thing too, Ryan. I don't know if you ever thought of it this way, but there's to me there's something odd about. You know, people will leftists who are worried about this, they'll set up this scenario where, oh, there's this unpopular minority 
that you know the the majority group doesn't like and the way we're going to protect them is to give more power to the government that is elected by majority rule right. like the, the, you know to me it, that's the exact opposite if you had you know let's let's say people with red hair to you know to not make it so you know hair tr triggering uh for people that you know let's say the community really just hates redheads you know they and this they would just as soon see them die well you better hope if you're a redhead you you're in a society where there's limited government strong respect for property rights and individualism not one where the state can do whatever it wants as long as the public votes in the right people because if by stipulation the public hates your guts and you're one percent of the population you're in trouble in that kind of society whereas one that respects the rule of law and individual rights then you know the the public might hate your guts but at least they can't you know kill you without going to jail right and well and that's a minority that's so small um, and of course, we could come up with other like less jokey groups, right? That other than redheads. But if you're in a very small minority, right, you don't even have safety in numbers where you could you could at least put together enough people where you could apply some pressure to the legislature and at least put a dent in uh, in voting totals and be part of a larger coalition or something like that. When you're part of a very small minority, yeah, all you have on your side is ideology where people just they have some respect then for private property and will let you uh mind your own business cuz yeah if <laughs> if you're just making decisions based on purely um political considerations of whatever the majority happens to feel in their hearts at any given time uh and you're a small minority you're probably going to be in deep deep trouble so yes uh handing over uh uh, faith in democracy to solve these sorts of problems, probably um, you're going to have a bad time is uh, really, I think, probably what the likely outcome is. Well, yeah. So I got, I mean, in fairness, I guess what the progressive would say, you know, hearing this conversation, oh, no, no, no. So you guys, what it is, is that there's like local more, you know, state, state and local areas, regions of the country where the local majority are a bunch of, you know, bigoted redneck hicks that we can't stand but then the the larger overarching group the majority is all respectable people like us you know who have the the right views and everything and are the march of history and so we're gonna vote at the federal level to impose our views on these you know backward hicks um you know and overrule their majority rule down, down there so i guess i don't know if you have a response to that but that's i, mean, I guess i would say okay right and the, the hero of liberalism fdr literally set up internment camps for all the Japanese people. <laughs> and so it's, you know, there's like a, a counter example to that, to that framework. But well, I think the reality is, is that they don't actually favor democracy, um, without, um, a safety net, a, uh, a panic button provided by elites, like say the Supreme court. I mean, they've just mm -hmm. relied on, uh, a small elite uh, to really say, well, you know, yes, the majority in Congress voted for this, but we've decided that doesn't really, uh, that doesn't align with our view, so therefore we're going to overrule you. Um, you look, for example, at, at uh, this happens a lot when states pass laws uh, designed to um, basically enact what the majority clearly favors, and then they just have a federal judge overrule it. So if you actually favored mm -hmm. democracy, you would not have favored a federal judge overruling California's vote to outlaw gay marriage, right, right. where a sizable majority voted in favor of that prohibition, including, and mostly, lots of non-whites, like L.A. County voted in favor of that prohibition driven largely by the Hispanic vote. And to then have a, a highly educated elite federal judge come down and say, well, you know, democracy works sometimes, but not in this case. So we're just gonna overturn it. You people got it wrong. Democracy was wrong. Um, and so that's how they're that's how they really feel about democracy is that it's okay as long as we have some elites at the top who can overrule you when necessary. And of course, many right-wingers would actually agree with that. All these people who always send me messages saying America's not a democracy, it's a right. republic. I guess they have some idea that there's some elite somewhere that will override uh, democracy in that case. Of course, the very same people are populists on other issues and, and demand just uh, majority rule. So I suppose in many cases, there's not really... <laughs> 
a whole lot of uh, consistency on that issue. Now, of course, my position is that uh, decentralization addresses a lot of that, where you're going to have certain majorities in certain areas, and that those groups then should be able to find a place where they're comfortable with the majority. And being descended from Hispanic immigrants, I could totally understand the the idea of wanting to live in certain parts of, say, the American Southwest, where there's going to be other people like you in sizable numbers around, and that I think there's definitely some feeling of safety there, both politically and just sociologically, right? There's other people here I share religion with, and people who I know are uh, going to be nice to me uh, during times of, uh, say, economic collapse or civil unrest or things like that, because they're going to see me more as a neighbor and not as a group to compete with. And so people are going to congregate in certain places, and those people should probably should have a right to some level of self-government, if not just undisturbed self-government. So there, there is, I think, that issue is probably a more... Uh, consistent backup plan than just ensuring that you have uh, federal judges who agree with you and went to the correct schools to overrule the the Democratic voting public whenever they vote uh, wrong. Yeah, yeah, you raised some good points there. Uh, my little thought experiment I used to do, because I, I think one thing going on here is you're right, certainly people on the left, they use that, what they really mean by democracy is good government. That, that's really what they, it has nothing to do with like the actual etymology of the term democracy. And, and the, the thought experiment I would do is let's say Trump at the height of his popularity, you know, before all the COVID stuff and whatever, let's say, you know, he, when, when he was you know, railing against the media or whatever, let, let's say he did a thing and, and got the public and said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to ban CNN. Who's with me. And somehow he got, you know, 52% of the public to go along with that. And they, and the government just banned CNN. I am, I would bet my left arm most of the liberal critics would say this undermines our democracy, even if by stipulation there was a referendum and 52% of the people voted to ban CNN. They would say this violates our democracy, right? <laughs> and so it's again, just underscoring to them, yeah, democracy does not mean anything except the type of government I like. Or you know, um, the same thing like with the Brexit vote or whatever. Yeah, when, when there's an outcome they don't like, it's not, well, the will of the people is the will of the people. It's these idiots did something wrong and this is crazy. You know, we need to, we need to rectify the situation. And also what your remarks too, right? About the, you know, the people kind of tend to congregate in there. So even like in cosmopolitan cities, like, you know, New York city, for example, there's still a Chinatown and there's different. And so it is that, you know, some new immigrant comes in, they're naturally, you know, they're allowed legally and even socially it's, you know, you could live wherever you want. It's not that, you know, some group's going to, beat you up or something until you move out. But yeah, there is this natural inclination to go when you want to kind of be around people that certainly that speak your language. If you, you know, if you don't know English very well and it's just, you know, the restaurants or food that you're familiar with and that, 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 and that, that just kind of, and that's a lot of people. So even the people touting cosmopolitanism, Oh yeah, I love going to New York and all the different cultures under strict enforcement of some of the, like the, you know, left liberals views of things. New York wouldn't look like that. You know, that would have been considered bigotry and race. You know, no, no, you got to go, you know, every neighborhood has to be exactly, you know, in terms of reflecting the overall composition of the po of the different groups in New York City, instead of being all concentrated in different pockets and different neighborhoods. And then you wouldn't have this nice, you know, smorgasbord to choose from. And look at how great we are here in tolerance. So there's a lot of inner contradictions besides me kind of disagreeing where they're coming from, like even on their own terms, this, you know, some of their worldview components don't fit together. Yeah, and I think just the larger issue is people are very complex in how they uh, value where they go, what they spend money on, the sorts of people they uh, like to give their money to. And that 100% brings us back to the sports issue, is for whatever reason, people prefer to watch men run around and chase this ball on this green soccer pitch. Uh, and larger numbers prefer to watch men do this. Why? Um, it's not just because they can run faster than women, or if they were, if they played in a game against women, they would score more goals or something like that. Clearly, there's something more to that. Maybe it's just because it's been around longer, and there's some nostalgia associated with it, or they've just convinced themselves that people being faster is more worthy of watching on TV. Or something. These are, of course, just all arbitrary choices based on 
some sort of complex cultural origins that these people come from and what they've decided at some point. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, they're just consumers deciding they like this thing that they want to buy. Uh, but until you can convince consumers to change this mixture of views, uh, they're going to give certain money seemingly arbitrarily to, in this case, to the male soccer team in terms of fandom uh, rather than the women's soccer team. So you have to change what the consumers want. Um, and only then will, will the women get higher pay in a sustainable fashion. Because, yeah, you could just demand that, hey, we need to pay all of the female athletes more. Well, then uh, that can't be sustained beyond the very short term if there's not more consumer money coming in. Mm -hmm. But there would be more consumer money coming in if everybody just said, hey, you know what? I do find women's sports to be just incredibly entertaining. I'm going to watch more. I'm going to buy jerseys from it and all of that. And if they did decide that, I wouldn't care. I'm not, I wouldn't be upset like Matt Walsh probably would be <laughs> if uh, people liked women's sports. I just don't right. care. Uh, but the fact is that they don't in as large numbers. So that's just the current reality. You know, it, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, of course, right? And even on its own terms, too, like, maybe I'm sure somebody thought of this and whether they asked her literally or, you know, just said it at the time when Megan Rapinoe's views were, you know, when she was first saying all that stuff. But why is it just women and men in soccer? Like, what about male ping pong players? Shouldn't they get paid as much? You know, like, what if some guy is just crushing? And I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing that the male ping pong player doesn't earn that much money. But maybe I'm wrong. But certainly I could come up with some hobby that somebody might be the best in the world at and yet doesn't make as much money as Megan Rapinoe did. And I could say, you know, is that why that seems to be unfair? And the, clearly the answer would be, well, no, at some level that, you know, it's if, if nobody cares about this thing, then where, where are you going to get a million dollar salary from that? Yeah, I, you know, I can I can mow my lawn better than anybody on planet Earth. And so, you know, I'm the best in the world. And so I should make as much as Tiger Woods did at the heat of he, uh, peak of his popularity and. No, that that doesn't follow. <laughs> Although I would say that in the in the world of 2023, it's possible you could convince people to watch you mow lawns on YouTube uh, in in huge numbers somehow, and you could make huge amounts of money. It, so, it's funny. Who you, knows? Yeah. <laughs> My wife, yeah, f found some YouTube channel. Some guy he would there would be like shut-ins who didn't take care of their lawn or something. He would show he had like a power washer. And he would just spray everything down. And then like, he was just getting tons of, I think it was like very soothing or something that people like he's cleaning up and maybe like was a metaphor for their own life. Like, yeah, I just need to take charge and clean up my life. I don't know what the explanation was, but yeah, he was getting tons of views just from showing up and doing a power wash and cleaning off people's Gen sidewalks. Gen Z calls it satisfying. It's satisfying to yeah. watch this guy reveal <laughs> the sidewalk underneath this sod. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's probably, I hope, I think we've probably at this point satisfied our listeners. They've gotten their fix of economics and cultural commentary. Uh, so my guest uh, this week has been Ryan McMakin. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you folks for tuning in. Keep watching sports and economics and everything else. And we'll see you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.